Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to say thank you to all of you for hanging in here with me on this sermon series. It has been a challenging one, and I know that. I know it has been hard to, to think about God in a way that you're not used to thinking about Him. But I hope and pray that every step of the way you've heard clearly that God's heartfelt desire is to love you and to bless you in His Son. That is what God wants more than anything else. And He wants it to be such a reality in your life that the day will come when you stand before Him in glory to be blessed by Him forever. And that's where we're going today. We're going to Judgment Day. And I know as soon as I say the words Judgment Day, it immediately conjures up in your mind the image of hellfire and brimstone, all the harshest aspects of God's image come to mind when you hear Judgment Day. And if someone is an unbeliever, that is true. But what about God's children? What about those who believe in Jesus, who have faith in Jesus? What is that day going to hold for us? It is not a day to fear. It is not a day to dread. It is, in reality, a day for us to look forward to. We had several people on the prayer list this morning. Some have passed. Some are grieving those who have passed. Some have, have, are, are near the point of passing. You know, our judgment day is going to be the day our life in this world ends and we stand individually before God. Or that great judgment day when all humanity is gathered before the throne. The words that God speaks to us will be the same. If we are His children. Now there's some things about the final, ultimate, end of time judgment day that, that you know about from Scripture. Things that will mark that day. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice that sounded the trumpet and the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And there, as all humanity from the beginning of time to today sees Jesus in all of His glory, what does Scripture say? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It will be a day that everyone sees Jesus. Everyone of all time. And you'll see them. Do you realize that? You will see Adam and Eve as they were on the day God created them. You'll know who they are. And the great patriarchs of old and the, the prophets and teachers and apostles. You will see those great saints gathered before the throne celebrating who Jesus is. And you'll see people you've known in your life. The plumber that came to your house and stopped your sink. The electrician who worked on the sockets. The girl who checked you out at the grocery store. Your first grade teacher will be there and your best friend in high school. You'll see all those people there. And you will hear what Jesus has to say. And what is the determining factor of what you hear? What will he say to those after this time of separation has been passed? Those on the left and those on the right. We don't like to think about that, do we? Even as God's children, we tend to run away from that day. We tend to think that, that death is something that can be put off and forgotten about. And, and pretend like it's never really going to happen. It's the day that everyone fears. But should we? I'm going to tell you a secret this morning, and I'm going to tell you a secret in which I am betraying every pastor I know. So mark this down. Every pastor wants to keep this a secret, and every pastor is going to be mad at me for telling you this. But as a pastor, and every pastor I know, by and large, I would rather do two, rather do two or three funerals instead of one wedding. Understand that? Funerals are easy. Yes, there's grief, and yes, there's, there's tears, and yes, there's sadness, and yes, there's hardship, but funerals are easy because it's the one time when the world stands silent and people simply want to hear what God has to say. And they're willing to listen. 
And what is it that God wants to say to those who are grieving the loss of a loved one? When, what is it God says on that individual judgment day when somebody dies? There is no reason to be. Christ died. So forgiveness is real. Death here gives way to life and eternity in the presence of God. The hope and the comfort that God gives overcome grief and despair. And we live with confidence. The simple message of the gospel is the message that people want and need to hear. That in Christ there is victory. And death is defeated and life becomes a reality because Christ lives. That's a simple message for a preacher to preach. And it's the message that makes Judgment Day a day of celebration. And that's why when we gather for a funeral, we gather to celebrate someone's life. The life we've had with us and the life that God has granted them in turn. It's a day of hope. And I'll tell you another secret about preachers. We're no different than you are. There are things that we fear, and things that we run from, and there are things we find challenging. It is absolutely no different for the preacher in the pulpit or the person in the pew. When you walk outside these doors, life is hard. Some people like to think the preacher's got it all together. Believe me, usually we're the ones that have the least together. And it's hard to live trusting everything. It's hard to live holding on to that hope that sometimes it's so hard to see. You just have to hold on to it. It's much easier to get wrapped up in the, in the, the pats on the back and the accolades and the, the feel-good stuff. It's much easier to seek after the things the world admires instead of the things that God admires. A missionary named Henry Morrison, a great man at the turn, you know, in the middle, early 1900s. He had left in the late 1800s and it had, uh, or somewhere in the 1800s, had gone to Africa as a missionary with his wife. He spent over 40 years serving as a missionary. His time was up, he was growing older, he was ready to retire, and he and his wife boarded a ship and sailed back to America. As they got near New York Harbor, they, they begin to wonder, will anyone remember us? Will anyone be there at the, at the port of the docks to meet us, to greet us, to welcome us home? And as they passed the Statue of Liberty, they were pulling into New York Harbor, they went up on the deck and looked, and the, the, the ramparts were filled with people. Bands were playing, people were cheering, the signs were out saying, welcome home. And they were so excited. They went down to their cabin and gathered the luggage. By the time they got back up on deck, they looked and everyone was gone. Teddy Roosevelt had been returning from Africa on that ship. He'd been on a hunting trip. And the crowds were there for them, for him. And no one was there to the Morrison's. They went to the hotel and missionary Morrison was noticeably sad. And he says, I don't understand it. Forty years we've labored in the Lord's service. Forty years and no one even remembers us. His wife went and sat down on the bed beside him, put her hand on his shoulder. He said, Henry, you have to remember. You're not home yet. You're not home yet. This world is not our home. This is our place of temporarily passing through. We are going home. And when we go home, there is nothing to fear. There's nothing to worry about. Because there we will be welcomed. And the celebration will begin. There's another account. Sadly, this one's very accurate. The young pastor and his wife had the pleasure of bringing a child, a little boy, into this world. The little boy was sick. He was just a few years old. And he was definitely ill, critical, terminal, and there was nothing they could do about it. Every night, he and his wife would take the little boy and tuck him into bed 
and pray earnestly for God to provide a miracle. Night after night they prayed, and day after day the little boy got worse. And one night, the little boy turned to his father and says, Daddy, what does it feel like to die? And you can imagine a father's heart breaking, having to try to explain to the little boy what it's like to die. And he thought for a second and scrambled in his mind and kind of said, Son, let me tell you something. Every single night, you lay on the couch and fall asleep watching your favorite television show. And unbeknownst to you, I come in and I gather you up in my arms and I take you to your home, to your room, the place that your mom and I made for you. And I tuck you into bed so you're safe and secure. I do that every night for you when you fall asleep. And the day is going to come, son, when you fall asleep and Jesus is going to come. And he's going to gather you up in his arms. He's going to take you home to the place he's prepared for you. So you don't have to worry or be afraid. You're just going home. What will it take for us to live like that? To live with that confidence and that assurance that there is a place for us prepared. We, we fear death. We're scared of it. The medical industry spends billions of dollars a year to give us one more day. And yet it's inevitable. We are going to die. And we're going to stand before the Lord. And we're either going to be on the left or the right. We're going to hear words of judgment or words of, 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 of total acceptance. And how are we to know which we are? No, Jesus kind of lays it out for us. He says, we know that in the parable of the sheep and the goats, there's a separation takes place. It's not that complicated. You really don't need a preacher to explain it to you. I was hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and in prison. You came to me. You ministered to me. And the others, they didn't. So what is Jesus saying to us? You fed me, you clothed me, you gave me something to drink, took care of me, and so for that I'm going to forgive your sins? No. Or to the others, you didn't do any of those things, so you failed the test. No. I want you to hear something loud and clear. No one has ever been judged by God and cast into hell because of sin. Sin has never sent anyone to hell. What determines eternity with God or eternity separated from God is does the heart love Jesus? Is there faith? And when Jesus looks out on the people and separates them, those who, who loved him more than anything else in their lives weren't self-centered and self-focused. They lifted their eyes off, himself, off of themselves and looked at the world around them and they loved other people as Jesus does. He's not saying because you fed me, you get to go to heaven. He says because you fed me and you clothed me and you ministered to me, I knew and could see the evidence of love in your heart. For those who didn't, there was evidence that there was no love for God. And so if today was the day, if today was the day that you stood before God, what would He say to you? Would He look at your life and see a, a life testifying to absolute, total love for Him? Or would he see the evidence of a life that loved itself, yourself, more than God? So when you're honest with your own heart, do you love Jesus more than anything else? You don't have to really pretend or mince words. This isn't a place to, to ignore the obvious. If you don't love Jesus with your whole heart, the question is, why not? What's keeping you away from the God who loves you so much? What 
would what would cause you to turn away from the one who's given everything to love you? But the opposite is also true. If you can look into your heart and say with absolute certainty, yes, I love Jesus more than myself. I love Jesus more than anything else, more than life itself. Jesus is the one I love. Then what will you expect on that day? If today was the day, what will you hear Jesus say to you? Come. Come, you blessed my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because you loved me. Because you had faith in me. Everything of my Father's is yours. You will have Jesus look right at you and say, well done my good and faithful servant. Welcome home. And like the missionary Morrison, on that day, there will be banners flying and angels singing, all of heaven rejoicing, for God will honor you. God will celebrate you because you're home. And because through your life, because you simply loved Jesus more than anything else, he was able to touch the lives of countless others. And he was able to glorify himself through you. And for that, he will celebrate you and honor you for all eternity. As you stand in his presence to experience the fulfillment of his love. And his promises for you. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the life of Christ to part in peace. Amen. We join in singing.